The best developers rarely get the job. It's the ones that present themselves the best that do. Welcome back, listener, to another exciting episode. In this episode, we will talk about how you can land a job in tech industry. And to talk about this, we have invited co-founder of Crushing Digital. A warm welcome to David and tell us about yourself. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's awesome to be here chatting with you. So um, a little bit about me. I've been in this industry for coming up 24 years now. So I graduated from uh, university back in 2000, so a long time ago. And uh, I worked my way up from junior through to senior roles, started leading tech teams and then head of department, CTO kind of roles. And then I like to say I was tricked into being a, a recruiter. So I jumped to the dark side, as, as many people would call it. And then I've uh, ran three international recruitment teams. So in that time, I've hired uh, hundreds of developers. I've interviewed thousands of de developers and seen pretty much every mistake that developers can make. So that's what's led me to starting my own business and trying to teach developers how to avoid many of the mistakes that I see so often. Yeah, that is very interesting because like I haven't seen anyone, you know, starting a recruitment company and have a background in like pure tech background, like, you know, mm -hmm. working as a CTO and then like doing that. But it gives you the edge as well because you have that technical knowledge as well because you're hiring the tech experts so then you have that knowledge and you have worked in the industry so it you can actually hire good hr resources for yourself and then you can hire good people for other person as well so yeah that's good yeah i think i think it's also a good thing you know lots of developers Lots of people go into development and, you know, might find out at various stages, might put, some people get burnt out. Some people just realize it's not for them. And I'm hopeful that more people will take that path and become, um, you know, entangled in, in the recruitment side of things. I think recruitment needs more people with an, a tech understanding. We need a tech understanding in almost every department now. So uh, I think that's, when I, when I started working on the recruitment side of things, I always worked on the side of the developer because I am one. I I was one. Yeah. So I think most recruiters often are seen in a negative light because they work on the side of the client, on the on the, the business side of things. And developers wish there was someone more on their side of the fence, more, you know, um, backing them up. And I think that's where I saw this gap and thought I can be that person that's in between and i quite enjoyed my time in in recruitment um but in the end of, uh, i i think i found that i'm always going to be on that side of the developer so rather than trying to fight an industry i thought i'd try and teach developers because there's so many developers out there today that say recruiters need to learn more about tech yeah. and you know that's why i you know i think it would be a good thing if developers got involved in recruitment but actually for the best results and this is probably something we'll end up talking about today is we need to learn more about how that recruitment game works and how, how we can maximize our benefit out of that. Yeah, you are absolutely right because all the recruiters can't have that tech knowledge. So you are obviously an exception, but obviously 95%, they don't know anything about tech and they are hiring for the hiring the tech person. So yeah. I believe, uh, one, the biggest issue there is that most of the tech guys, they don't know how to properly communicate. Like I know that there are a lot of people who are very skilled and they have the experience, they have the skills, but the issue is when they are on the call with the HR person or they, they are doing a technical interview, they are not fully portraying their self. So that basically, you know, then obviously they don't get that particular job. Yeah, well, I think, you know, the interview itself creates its own problem because it's a stress um, thing. It's it's a stressful environment. You know, if you do more interviews, you might become more comfortable. But even still, it's it's kind of an unnatural conversation to be having. So people don't perform at their best. And a lot of the times, as developers, we like to think people see our value if we present it by just listing the technology 
by showing what we've done with it. And often that doesn't translate. And quite often I'll tell the story about me showing my wife uh, something I've built and it'd be a button maybe that calls an API and then grabs the JSON that comes back and unpacks it. And if I show my wife saying, look at this fabulous thing I've built and she'll be looking at me with, you know, disdain thinking it's just a button. I click buttons on websites every day, you know, so when when a, a junior developer says to me, look at my Netflix clone, I always make the joke back saying, it's okay, I've got Netflix. I'm not impressed by you making something that's exactly the same. But in the same way, if we step back from the interview, uh, we we present ourselves in the wrong way as well. So we, we think that people will look at our resume, think, oh, this person can do anything, which is the the thing that most senior developers do. They just say, I'm a software developer. I can do anything. And we'll talk more about it in the interview. Whereas the recruiter's thinking, I don't see enough evidence of the value that's going to warrant me stepping into the interview. So they don't jump into that interview with you because they're scared that they might get there and you're not a good fit for the role, in which case they're wasting their time. But this then leads us to how recruitment really works, which is so far away from how developers think it works. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And in the market, there's also a very big issue that the junior developers, they have like all sort of problems when they are finding a job because in the market, every company is advertising that they need a person with five years of experience or at minimum two years, right? So I, yeah. I hardly see posts now that says that a fresher can apply. Previously, back in the days, like if you go five years, six years back or more, you see certain posts that says, you know, freshers are can apply and that's good. But now I don't see these sort of posts. So what's your take on that? So there's a few uh, things going on here. Um, but so let's talk about the job specifications. Quite often, a job specification would come into me for the recruitment team and Bear in mind, I'm slightly different having come from a technical background, being a software developer. So this specification wouldn't make any sense. You know, too many years of experience, things that didn't exist, uh, you know, a few years back, crazy um, tech that just doesn't go together. And I would then push back saying, okay, you might be looking for this particular um, piece of technology. A good example used to be trying to find someone with DynamoDB experience. Now, back then, this is a few years back, I couldn't find developers with uh, experience with it. But I knew this is just no sequel. If I, if I could find someone with solid MongoDB experience, would that be sufficient? And when I pushed back to that um, client, they would say, oh, yeah, of course. You know, we just use DynamoDB if someone had experience with that, it'd be great, but solid no SQL uh, experience would be great. But I'm in a unique position to be able to push back. And most recruiters are not. They're going to take that job specification and run with it. <clears throat> so therefore, they don't get those nuances. Now, secondly, when sometimes I push back on the, on the um, client and say, what's going on with this job specification? The more I press, the more you get uh, the answer that someone's been passed this job specification internally by the technical manager to someone in HR. And they said, you know, we're hiring somebody, put put out an advert. And they say, well, what, what advert do I put out? And they go, oh, you know, same as last time. And they're thinking, I can't find the job specification from last time. So rather than admit that, they just go around trying to find something similar to what they did. And it's a cut and paste from various other job boards, which is why it looks like a job specification has been stitched together from lots of other jobs out there. So the job specifications shouldn't be relied on. I would say if you're a good fit for 70% of the job, you should be applying. Don't worry about the years of experience. What you need to be showing is, uh, evidence of your proactivity about either knowing that or learning that. So the next thing about junior jobs is in this market, the jobs are not on the big job boards. So developers often come to me, juniors, saying, I've applied to 300 jobs and I've heard nothing. And I always ask them the same question, where and how are you applying? I have never, ever, ever had a different answer to this question than LinkedIn, Indeed, Total Jobs, or depending on which country you're in, the big job board for your country. Um, and so that's 100%. I've never had a different answer. Now, 
I then tell the story, you know, if we had, in a, in a, it's with a junior developer, if we had a business and you're really busy and I'm the business owner and I think, okay, let's hire someone to help you, where should we advertise this? And I'm cheap because I'm a business owner, you know? Uh, so they go, well, let's put it on LinkedIn. We put that job on LinkedIn and we know that thousands of people are going to apply because there's rarely a junior role on LinkedIn. So when I was working in an agency, I'd get between 1,000 and 3,000 applicants. If you're on LinkedIn, that number is a lot higher. So let's take the small number. A 1,000 people apply. And this is where the, uh, the understanding of how recruitment works. We're trying to be faster than our competitors. Otherwise, we're not going to get paid. So the magic window is about three days to get a, a developer or three or four developers in front of that client so we can beat our competitors. How do I interview a thousand people in three days? I can't. So I have to hedge my bets and look for who's the best on paper. And this is where most developers just put software developer, in which case there's no indication of what they do. Are you a good fit for the role? I don't know. I'm not going to waste one of my interview slots on somebody who might say, oh yes, I did do React before, but I'm I'm more interested in view nowadays, or I've moved on to a different stack. So I look for the person who presents themselves the best that is going to be a surefire guarantee that this person does that for a job. So we've got three days. How many people can I interview? Maybe 10. Yeah. That means 990 people of every thousand are going to be rejected by a recruiter who's not technical and they probably didn't read your profile. It was a quick scan to see if you look like you're worthy of more of my time in an interview. So, you know, uh, to get through that a thousand people, uh, if, if I'm hiring to help you and you're my lead developer, I can't filter a thousand people. And everyone talks about this online saying, you know, you should interview everybody. You should give everybody constructive feedback. I can't do that. Not in three days. So how do I do this? Yeah. We can't do this. We should get somebody else to do the filtering for us and just interview the top five people. Those people are called recruiters. But how much does a recruiter cost? Now, in the US and UK, average 15 to 20% of the starting salary. Starting salary in the US is about $80,000. That means it costs twelve to $16,000 for the privilege of hiring a graduate. Now, as a small business owner, I'm not paying $12,000 for the privilege of hiring a graduate. When I could go along to a boot camp and ask them, I could look at people on social media, I could see if anyone applied direct. The point is 100%, as we discussed earlier, 100% of junior developers are all applying on the big job boards. And as we've just established, the jobs for junior developers are not on LinkedIn and they're not with the recruiters. And that's the problem. Yeah, that's, that's quite, you know, uh, insightful that I haven't even thought about this that but now if someone asks me that you know as a junior developer I want to get a job I think from what you tell that we have to directly apply to the companies like if mm. there are and then I think like we should apply to small companies and startups like usually I believe they are they, they are it's like more percentage that they reply back to you because they have sometimes mm -hmm. less budget and they are thinking of guys that are starting they can help the senior guys so in that case but like yeah obviously applying on big job portals and these things yeah, it doesn't make any sense yeah so I, I it's interesting when I ask developers like where they're applying and they all say the same place. And then when you think about these companies, when I call them as a recruiter, because we like to think that recruitment works in this way where a company thinks to themselves, we should hire somebody. And they ring up an agency, say to the agency, have you got any developers? And they say yes and send someone over. This never happens. Yeah. Re the recruiters, the vast majority of their job is actually trying to find companies who are willing to hire. So we're ringing companies all day, trying to open up an opportunity. And when I ring these companies and say, hey, are you hiring? The standard answer is always no, always no. And then if I press a bit harder, they say, well, we're always hiring if someone interesting comes along. Now, what does that mean? It means you use the right technology so that you're, you're valuable to them. Yeah. And then the fee for hiring you is not too high. So they basically want to drive me down in price or they'd hope I go away and I, I take zero fee. 
So if I can encourage you to start going away from the job board, start being more proactive in how you find these companies and start networking strategically with companies that already do hire for your tech stack, they may not even have a job open, but you start pushing your resume in the door saying, I think I'm valuable to you because this is my stack and I, and I really want to work with you and sending them an email. Now they're looking at a spreadsheet of developers from the agency where they've got to pay thousands and thousands of dollars for the privilege of talking to them or your resume and they talk to you for free. And the, the more I get people to do this, the more interviews they land. And now instead of being one of a thousand applicants, you're one of five or one of 10. And yeah. then your odds of employment go through the roof. That's that's true. And that's that's a great strategy, I must say. And with that, like obviously we discuss about the junior developer issues and problems they face. But mm. if you talk about the senior developers as well, sometimes you know, a lot of these senior developers say that we have like really hard time, you know, in the job interview process or just landing the job interview as well. So what is your take on that? Like why it is so hard for them as well? So again, there's two things happening here. And, and most of my time hiring uh, developers in the recruiting field was for very senior developers. <clears throat> so the first and most common problem is once you've been in the tech industry for a while, the chances are you've jumped from front end to back end or or to full stack, you, you jump between the two as you get bored and, and you you want to try different. You might change language, you might change framework or library. And this is common for, for any developer that's been around for long enough. And then we get to that stage where we say, I'm tech agnostic. Yeah. As, which is a fair label. You know, it's okay to, to think of yourself as that, but it doesn't translate to someone who's not technical. So most senior developers just put software developer or programmer or I've seen various job titles, but it's very vague. Now that when a recruiter arrives and looks at your profile and it says software developer, and even when I press them and say, yeah, but what do you do? And they say, I can do anything. No, is this, think of it in a, in a Google search. You have yeah. to be more and more specific because if you just type in software developer on LinkedIn, you're going to get millions and millions and millions of results. So we yeah. get more specific, more specific, more specific, and then they filter it. So when when people put jobs on, on LinkedIn and thousands of people apply, they start pushing the the job spec up and going, well, well, we'll demand five years of experience. We'll demand that you've got this, 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 and this. And then if you can't demonstrate those skills, if I can't see them very quickly on your LinkedIn profile, on your resume, on your GitHub, if, if it's not evidence that you do these things, then I'm not going to jump in and waste that interview slot. We've only got a handful of interview slots, as we talked about. So someone might say, well, I've done Python, but then I look on GitHub and they haven't touched Python since 2018. Now I'm thinking if I jump into this interview, are they going to, are they still up to speed with Python? Do they want to do Python? What if I get there and they say, I used to do Python, but I don't like it anymore. I want to do Go. I want to do something else. Now I'm thinking you've just wasted one of my slots and I can't have that because if I don't, if I don't win this client, my boss, my someone's going to say, what happened? Why didn't we put someone forward? And I go, well, I interviewed this person, but it turned out they didn't like Python. But why did you interview them? If they don't, you know, if I can't see when I look at their profile that they're wearing a Python hat with a Python tattoo and a Python t-shirt, then I'm nervous. So uh, this is where for very senior developers, I agree with you, you can jump between tech, but this is a marketing and sales problem this is not a tech problem and you're not making it you're not making that recruiter feel confident enough about jumping into that interview with you in which case what happens is they pick somebody else who looks like a better bet on paper and they say to you oh the client's gone quiet they said they'll come back next week the client never goes quiet they're just interviewing people that look better than you on paper and if they fail they'll come back to you other than that you're being yeah. rejected yeah, that's that was uh, quite insightful, and I, you know, hundred percent agree with you on the point that you have to specify like the niche of it. Like, for instance, for someone working in, on Amazon, they say that you have to niche down. You have to select a mm -hmm. niche that in that particular niche you will add your products. It's not like you add products. You have like footwear, and you say, okay, 
this is like a footwear you have nike puma all of that you are basically yeah. competing with them and you are nobody but if you niche down that this is the the shoes that you wear when you are going on a jogging on that particular sand area or something you're just niching down then you yeah. have a chance that a person is searching for that particular thing so same way in tech as well that i believe that people who write down that okay i do this like mern stack mean stack i do like machine learning with python and this they get like uh, calls more often than people who just say software engineer and like tech agnostic and these sort of things because it doesn't make any sense so yeah i That's- had a, a a developer come to me a friend of mine very good developer and he'd applied for a job and it was for a back end node.js developer and uh he said i've applied for this to this company three or four times and i've been rejected every time what am i doing wrong and obviously we looked at profiles and things like that so i said to him well for the jobs i'm hiring for at the minute and this was about four years ago five years ago um i said pretty much every node js role i have open at the minute um comes with a requirement for serverless experience so it specifically aws lambda was most frequently re- requested so i said you uh, do you have that as a skill and he's like of course i do i've been doing this for a long time yeah of course i do and i said yes but i'm looking at your profile and i can't see it and he says well come on it's a given it's yeah. standard right well it is to you as someone in the technical field but that recruiter's thinking i'm trying to find someone with no, maybe TypeScript, maybe uh, maybe it's Lambda and some other um, AWS uh, tools. And they're trying to tick them off. And the ones who tick the most of them are going to be bumped up the queue in terms of interview. And he said, this can't be it. So we changed the profile, put Lambda on there, reapplied, got the job. Oh. <laughs> but so this is where I think big job boards can be helpful. So think about the job title you want, go and look at those job boards and start to tally up if you're looking for a React job, what are the skills that are listed in the required skills? What are the skills that are listed in the nice to have? And start to tally them all up on a spreadsheet. And you'll quickly realize, well, I've got the top three or four skills, but have you made it apparent that you know them on your, that you might have missed them off your LinkedIn profile, missed them off your resume? They need to be made apparent. And then you think, well, then I've got the top four, but maybe the, the fifth one, I haven't got that that's the next one to be learning and putting on your resume to open up the market because they're telling you what's the most common roles. We just need to look more broadly across all the jobs and then start to say, I do have those skills, but have I evidenced them on my profile? Yeah, that's true. That's true. And what developers can do, like for a certain developer, they know that this is the company. I like this company and I want to work there. So, what a developer can do to showcase that particular company that I'm really interested in working with you. Because now, as you say that, you have to mention the skills and all of these things. So how it will be like if we just talk about one company and one developer? So I would do a whole bunch of things. Firstly, and this sounds ridiculous, I would go on their website, find the first email address that's visible, info at, hello at, or if not, fill in the contact form and send them a message just saying, I really want to work at your company. So the message should be very short and it should be tech first. So it should be, if it's a React job, I'm a React developer with Redux, TypeScript, Jest, React Testing Library, and you tick off all the the jobs. We'll come back to that in a second. I really want to work there. I really like your company and send them the message. Now, my theory on this is everyone's trying to stalk the hiring manager on LinkedIn, and they're getting bombarded so much that they're very good at filtering people out. The filling in the contact form, sending a message to the info at address goes to the marketing department who never get a message ever. They're so delighted that they've got a message. They read it and pass it on to the right person. So you get a lot more uh, acceptance when you do it this way. Next, what I would do is I would be looking at the, go on that company's LinkedIn page, click on people, and then type in, so if it's a React, I type in React and filter all the people that work there for the ones that use React. 
and then go and look at their profile and see if it lists all the tech that they're using in their current role and all the previous roles. And you'll start to get an idea, just like we talked about looking across all the, the job boards, look at what skills they have. So when you send them that message, you want to be highlighting that I'm a really good match for your current tech team. Next thing is when you see these people, we don't need to send a connection request because again, that developers are getting bombarded by people just saying, hi, oh, you don't know me. Can you recommend me? And they rarely do, if ever, but you can follow them without needing any, you know, any acceptance from them, follow them and specifically follow the ones that are uh, active and commenting and posting on social media, posting on LinkedIn, and then hit the notification bell. Now, whenever they put out a message, whenever they comment on anything, whenever they put out a post, you're going to add value to that post. This doesn't mean saying thanks for posting on their uh, comment. You actually ask questions uh, say, oh, I'm doing something similar, or what do you think about this? And uh, get involved in the conversation. Have this exchange two or three times. They'll send you a connection request. Now, when they that company does decide to hire, you'll be already on the lips of everybody that works there. You'll be connected to a bunch of them, and it looks like you're already part of the community anyway. Because what we're doing when we wait for this job to pop up on a job board, I always say it's like looking back you know, at the history of time and humans only arrived fairly recently and it's a blip in time when the humans arrived on this planet. Now, we're waiting for that blip when a job happens. Companies don't think that way. They start thinking, well, maybe we should hire. Should we hire soon? I don't really want to talk to a recruiter. I don't want to pay. And then your resume just slides in under the door that you get attention but your resume should then be clearly indicating all the skills that you know they use and this is a good thing actually for the interview as well because i always ask that i always ask one question in an interview why is this job open and they might tell you know the behind schedule in which case you tailor every answer you give that how you've brought projects back on track but quite often they'll say oh we you know we use node and react but the person who used uh, the person who was our knowledge on GraphQL left the company. Now you have GraphQL. That's actually why you're in the room, but you were about to spend the whole hour talking about Node and React, whereas you didn't realize GraphQL was your leverage. And it's the same thing if you start to look at what tech all the team is using. You might just be talking about generic React applications you've made or generic APIs that you've made in Node. But if you know that they use serverless or you know that they use graphql or you know that they use these tools you can start to drip these into the conversation to make you stand out and you can do that on your resume so everything about your presentation makes you look like a really good fit for their organization yeah that's that's amazing advice that the way you t tell us about tailoring everything you know like when you're talking with them uh, then you know that obviously these are the technologies and this is like the sort of project they are working on. And then based on that, you tailor your talk on that. It's not like you just saying, oh, I have done this, I have done this. You are telling all the projects and all the skill based on what they their requirements. So obviously, yeah, if a person does that and I'm taking an interview and we wanted a person with like AWS experience and with Nest.js and then they start talking about like Nest and then they start talking about AWS and all of a sudden in five minutes, I get this feeling that, oh, this is the right person. But your point is right that obviously if they are talking about what you as an employer you need, then obviously it's a very good chance that you will get that job. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if you can, instead of just saying, you know, when they say, have you got any experience with this skill? And you say, uh, yes or no. If you can say, oh, yes. And, you know, I actually had a conversation with David on your team who, uh, and he does it diff does something differently. And we talked about that. You already know the other developers. Yeah. You're, you're swapping ideas. It's like you're already up to speed with their development team. We're in sync already. Now we just need to do the paperwork. Yeah. That's, it's a done that's deal. True. Yeah, that's true. And if we talk about side projects, because all the developers, you know, they are building something on the side on the GitHub, or they are building some fancy designs or some library NPM module, maybe. So what's your take on that? If a developer want to start a side project or something, so what it should be? So 
for the most part, what the project is doesn't really matter. So we like to think, and you'll see this across all developers, it's like, if I have the right project, I will stand out and be noticed. If I have the right qualification, I will stand out. So people in boot camps think I need a degree. People who've got a degree think I need experience. Then they go, if I've got this skill, that skill, there's always something missing. And that's yeah. where we think that the right project is going to be the thing that everyone goes, finally, I see it. You are brilliant. That's not the way it works. So um, certainly when you're your junior it's even more important but it's the same for everybody proactivity wins so when i was hiring for developers who had to have seven plus years of experience and everyone's got seven years of experience how do you differentiate it comes down to proactivity so whatever you choose we need to document that journey we need to show you living and breathing it you're immersed in it so we can't just say i'm passionate i'm enthusiastic about things because that's just empty words we need to demonstrate that. So when I ask someone about their side project, I ask them about their portfolio website or anything. They always say, I'm not ready to talk about it yet. It's not finished. And I always say it should never be finished. We don't want it to be finished because the life of a developer is not opening up a clean repo, type for a few days, three commits, launch, millionaire. That's not the way life goes. The real life of a developer is working on old code, pulling this package out, putting this package in, refactoring. So your your portfolio, rather than having great examples of your work as your portfolio, your portfolio itself is the project. It's that living, breathing, as I put more projects on it, now I need pagination to show them. I need a search facility, then I need, and it, that's when it becomes a real project. So don't worry about is the project you know world dominating if it, if you've got a world dominating project congratulations you don't need a job you've just built a business but so it's not really about that it's about okay what project can you can you commit to in the long term that's going to keep your interest so over time you can start showing how you're learning all the finer points of react and redux and typescript and or whatever stack you're into that you're showing that I'm continually learning this. I'm never quite getting to the point of being done. There's always something new to learn. And once you know the, the you know, the, the libraries and the frameworks, then you're moving on to the cloud and then you're moving on to architecture. That's what we need to demonstrate is that you live and breathe this. So you'll never need to use those words like passion and enthusiasm on your profile anymore, because it will be there in abundance. When someone looks, they just see, you're constantly talking about all the things that we use. Yeah, that's true. I think one good example is that I see a lot of people as a, like, they're not very senior, but they post on LinkedIn that, you know, some, it can be a small text about system design. Then they post some picture of system design. Okay, this is how Netflix system work. It, it can be totally wrong. I have seen that. Like they have told, like, this is how this, particular application works and I've seen that I was like okay it doesn't work like that but still it shows that this person is interested in system design right so it can be a same case for a front-end developers they just they are I've seen them they are telling about like these are the new tags and this is how you can do this center this text or make this design or this slider and obviously when you look at it then you feel like okay you have those person in mind that yeah, these guys are really passionate about front-end development. This guy is really passionate about React. So then obviously, if you have that opportunity, like you want to hire a new person, then you, oh, I have seen that guy on LinkedIn. Like I saw mm. his post every day almost. So I can ask him as well. Like you just stand out in that way as well that a lot of people on your network can also contact you. And as mm. a HR or someone else, open up your profile. They also see that you are really interesting uh, interested towards this particular topic. It's not just like you are working just to make the money. Well, I'm I'm always going to be defensive of my, my interview slots, right? As a recruiter saying, I don't want to just interview if you're not right. So I would ask, now I would have a team of say 15 recruiters out searching. And I'd say, this is the job. This is the specification. Go and find people. And they come back and they present you to someone like me. <laughs> and then I say, why are you sending me this person? 
And, you know, it, so when they send me a senior developer profile, it just says software developer. And I say, why are you sending me this, this developer? They say, I don't know. They said they're really good. I'm like, I'm not interviewing that person. Sorry. But then, you know, and they're not technical. They don't know what all these terms mean and I can't expect them to. But when they say you asked for Node, I can see them using it in these three projects. You asked for React, I can see it here, here, and here. You asked for AWS Lambda, they've used it on these three projects. They've done their due diligence. They've done their job. And I go, okay, now I'll, now it's for me to ascertain how much do they really know and, and dig deeper. But let's not forget those numbers. At the start, there's a 1,000 applicants to the job. How many people get down to the interview? Maybe 10. So if you can get past those recruiters, there's enough evidence, there's enough indication that you live and breathe this, you're going to get into that 10. Yeah. And now it's up to you to actually, you know, win, it, win them over in the interview. That is difficult to prepare for because it's hard for me to teach someone how to pass a go interview, how to pass a, uh, a node interview. How to, I can't do that, but I can certainly yeah. work on getting you into more interviews, in which case the odds of employment uh, go sky high. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And, you know, like in interviews, sometimes it is very tough because it can be a case that the developer is stressed out because mm. of the interview. Or sometimes the other person is obviously, you know, asking a lot of things and they want you to be in that stressful situation. So it can be either way, but how a person can prepare for it that they are like ready and how no matter whatever the other person is saying, how hard it is, like, but they are fully prepared for that interview. So, I mean, like I say, it's difficult to to answer in terms of, you know, each particular tech stack and, and those sorts of things. I think, I mean, to, to cover this for the juniors, you need to know rules. And, and I wouldn't, I, controversial, I, I don't see any value in learning algorithm, you know, all yeah. the time. Uh, as someone who's spent 24 years doing this, when I need an algorithm, I Google it, I use it, I forget it. So if you remember lots of algorithms, you're probably quite strange. Um, so I, I would say there's not much value in that. I don't know why people put data structures and algorithms together. Data structures, you need to learn this. Uh, algorithms, I, I don't see any value in that. However, if you desperately just want to work at FANG or whatever the acronym is nowadays, um, then because they get so many applicants, they're going to push the requirements up and up and up until they know someone who knows everything. But that's their you know prerogative because that's Google, that's Netflix, that's that's how that works. So I would say you need to know your fundamentals. I would practice you know problem solving. Um, you know, examples doing that sort of thing. But I think the biggest game changer is, as you've alluded to, is about that fear. It's about that anxiety. And that's where, you know, that interview question that I mentioned earlier about asking a question at the start of the interview, not at the end, why is this job open? To try and turn it from being an interrogation into a conversation. I use this so I can calm down and actually start talk normally rather than feeling like because the fear for me and i guess for most people is what is the next question will i know the answer and that that fear is is the thing that drives you the next thing is certainly if you get into the one of those situations where it's um pair programming but even if you're given like a take-home test those sorts of things if you think back to school high school the teachers certainly used to say to me to show you're working now, it, it might mean you've got to work out this maths problem and get to a number at the end. Now, that number might be wrong, but we might be able to see you had you were nowhere near. You just had no idea what you were doing. And that's one thing. But they might also be able to see that you just made one little mistake here or one little mistake towards the end. And that was the problem, because when you're trying to filter people out, what we have to do is push the requirements up a little bit so that everybody fails. Now we need to understand what you know and what you don't know, because then we know which gaps we need to fill. But if you just sit there quietly and don't let what's in your head come out, if you don't sit there and talk to the person in pair programming, or you don't write the comment or write or tell me what's going on, all I've got is the number at the end. Did it work or did it not work? Whereas what they really want to know is what's it like to work with you? Because we've all... I've, I've worked in so many teams and I'm, I'm sure you have where 
you don't have to be the best developers in the world, but you have to have an element of trust and an element of camaraderie when you work together. And if you can show what it's going to be like to work with you, that you're not just super scared and defensive, that you're open to saying, I, I'm thinking of doing it this way, but I've also considered this way. Now you can have a conversation about it. And the more you start to present yourself as a human being in this overly hyped up that tech is the answer world, the, the better it's going to be. And, and I think that for me is, is, is kind of what brings it full circle. Everything about what you're doing in an interview, everything about how you get a job now has come full circle to its old school values. It's yeah. applying direct, it's presenting a human being, and then the rest will look after itself. But at the minute, everyone's got you hitting easy apply as fast as possible, yeah. applying to 10 million jobs and saying, does it work out? It works out for one person, but so does the lottery. Now, you can't be there upset that you didn't get the job when you knew you were one of millions of people applying. So go back to old school values because everybody else is doing the other thing. And if you want to stand out, don't do what everybody else is doing. So that interview thing, let the human being out, talk, talk it through. Everyone wants to work with people they like versus people who are just fantastic. Yeah. That's true. That's true. And I believe like in the coding situation, I have seen that a lot of people, they actually know how to like solve that particular uh, piece of problem. But during the interview, they are like really stressed and they, you know, getting confused and thinking the that's whole me. solution in their mind and not writing a word. So yeah. what I used to do is like, um, basically, whenever I used to see this particular uh problem and obviously it's like a interview call and then during that you're coding so i used to first like look at it like i might ask some questions from that person that okay and this we have to do this so that we are just doing the conversation it's not like i'm just reading 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 and that person just waiting for me to you know do anything it's just having conversation yeah. and then obviously your stress level is also going down because if both yeah. of you are quite obviously it's like tense oh it's two minutes nobody talk like so Obviously, they will try to stay quiet that you can focus on that. So then once you understand that, write some comment. Okay, I have to do this. I have to do this. I have to do this. This is I usually do. So they understand that I have I have understand the question and I have like broken them down into few steps. And then I start with, okay, this is the first like function I will create. And in that I will do this. And at the start, I write the comment so that they know before yeah. I even start writing that particular function that I'm going to add this thing in that. So they are basically, I feel like they're not like there to see that it actually gives the right result. They wanted to see the approach that, you know, how you approach that problem that for instance, yes. when they hire this guy and there's a big issue on production, it's like even more tough, right? Than the job interview one, because it's just a job, right? But they know that this guy, if there was a problem, he actually is not like freaking out. He just look at the issue, just, you know, breaking it down into smaller pieces and just start working on that. So this is what they are like looking for. Maybe you don't, uh, this has happened with me that I have like this uh, online coding challenge. And then during that, I like, did two of them like I did that and one of them I didn't like actually finished it like like almost the whole question was missed but in the end they say like we like you and then I was hired because they knew that the approach and how I was doing it so it can don't worry about oh I have missed this I don't have time just mm -hmm. like stay relaxed and try to you know uh, navigate through that uh, whole interview process most interviewers are more nervous than the interviewee and recruiters are nervous. And then when they're told to bring in, you know, a technical expert to, to answer some of these questions, they're more nervous that they're thinking, what if I, you know, get found out? What, what if it, it, they discover that I'm not as good as uh, everybody thinks? Everybody's yeah. nervous. So uh, if we all just actually presented our cards the real way and said, you know, I'm nervous and, and had a conversation, everything would be okay. Because I'm like, that person that you, you mentioned, I fall apart in that pressure. Uh, thing, I, things that you walk out the door going, I know the answer to all of those questions, but it just didn't come out. 
So yeah. that's why I started to find these techniques to how can I calm down? And I realized the more I can actually engage in a conversation with the person, yeah. the more I forget I'm in an interview. It's just now I'm just chatting to some person who's, yeah. you know, also interested in the same topics. And that's that's cool. Yeah, that's true. And about handling pressure. So I heard someone that, um, and it's like a good technique that if you are about to give a talk or a presentation or about the interview is about to start. So that person say that you just have to, you know, sit like properly, you know, with broad shoulders, don't be like this and just sit like properly, you know, you, you just look confident. And then in the start, like uh, you just have to say hello or, uh, you know, how you, how you have been doing today and like stuff like that. And don't think about the rest of it. Just think about like the first one or two sentence. And then from there, you can like, you know, carry on just because the issue occurs because we are thinking about like, what happens if that person asks about this uh, Redex toolkit? And I don't know about this. And I know about Redex, but not that that thing, yeah. right? So yeah. we are thinking about these things that I, we don't know actually. And then we're getting, we just have to, don't worry about this. Like just stay calm and just Think about maybe like just because we have to think our mind is works in a way that we have to actually think something in our mind. Right. So we just have yeah. to think about, OK, uh, I will talk to this person and then I will just start the conversation with this particular line. And yeah, this is you I don't think, always have to answer a question. With yeah. an answer. So quite often someone would ask me a question in the interview and to buy myself some time. I'd ask a question back. Oh, can you clarify what you mean by this or clarify that? Or do you mean, how do you mean, uh, or go, tell me a bit more. Now, like I said, they're, they're nervous as well. And you quickly yeah. realize when you ask them a question back, they don't know either. Uh, mm. So now I'm like, oh, okay. Now I'm not so nervous. Uh, and, and whenever I've done that, whenever I've pushed back, I realized they don't know the answer, which, which is also a, a great story. I went to an interview once and, filled in the test did the test handed it in and there was two questions at the end that i just i you know it's one of those ones i knew the answer but i, I couldn't get to it and i just said okay I've, i think i've done okay so i'll forget those two off the end i'm, I'm done and i put an answer down but well it wasn't yeah. right and then i got the job which was great and then i started at that company and then on the first day i said can i ask how did i do on the test and they said, oh, well, you're, you're the first person ever to get 100%. And I'm thinking, well, I know I didn't get 100% because yeah. I know those two were wrong. Yeah. Uh, so I said, I, can I look at that test? So once we dug deeper into it, they'd been running this test for like two years with developers that came in, but they didn't know the answer to any of the questions. And yeah. then when I came in, they said I was so confident that they just assumed I was right so now they've been using that afterwards when they interview everybody, they use my answers as the template answers for, for the test, even though they're wrong. <laughs> oh, that's, that's crazy. Because, the power of confidence. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's true. Because obviously the, the HR person sometimes doesn't know and then they have this small template because when I was uh, working in the previous company, I used I have given like list of 15 questions to the HR and I have given like one line answer. So mm. you're right. Like they don't know about that. Like if a person start talking and they're very confident, the HR might think that, oh, they, that looks fine that they know about this topic. So yeah, that was like interesting uh, talk. So what is your final piece of advice for someone who is looking to land a new job? So I would say, so it leads me to one of my favorite phrases, the best developers rarely get the job. It's the ones that present themselves the best that do. So regardless of how you look for um, jobs, you know, whether it's on the big job boards, whether you're using recruiters, whether you start to think differently and apply direct, we need to think about what is valuable to the other person. Now, when I say what's valuable to the other person, let's take the uh, the recruiter looking at your profile. People write their profile saying, oh, you know, I like long walks on the beach and I like coffee and I like cats. And, and this is how the about section usually goes. That's of no value to, to the other person. We tend to think people 
because we've applied that people want to read our profiles. They don't. If they see that you're valuable, if they think I can sell you to my client, if I can make money, if I can use you to make me look good in my job and I get a promotion, I get a pay rise, then you're valuable. Then they're willing to read about what you do. So we just need to think about what we present. Are you presenting a developer who's skilled, a developer who's proactive, and that lives and breathes this thing that you've applied to do. And if you can start to present that and put that value at the top of everything so that the first lines in everything you do is drilling this home, that you live and breathe this, you'll start to stand out and you'll start to get a lot more interviews and the rest will look after itself. This is about demonstrating proactivity on your profiles. And this is a sales and marketing job. It's not about the tech. Yeah, that, that is that is amazing. You know, the way you explain it and everything that makes a lot of sense. And I hope like it helps like a lot of developers and junior or senior developers that they land more jobs after listening to this conversation. And that brings us to end of another exciting episode. And thank you so much, David, for uh, joining this podcast. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me on. It's been excellent talking to you and i hope your listeners get value from it yeah for all the listeners you know work on yourself all the piece of advice that we have talked about you know how to showcase yourself how to demonstrate yourself apply all these techniques and get better and until next time have a nice day and bye-bye bye-bye